States, and I was kind of, um, I don't know, I, I kind of had enough, and I was basically fucking my way around America, and it was kind of like spiritually, I was, I guess, spiritually adrift and all that, but I was in quite a good frame, and we'd been in El Paso, and had a good time in El Paso, and we had to fly to Phoenix, and, well, just me and JC were going to fly to Phoenix with the tour manager to do this very important news interview. Um, I'd had my bag stolen from a hotel in Dallas, which had my drape coat and my wrestling boots, all loads of great stuff. So I was carrying my belongings in a stolen pillowcase. Um, and the last night we were in El Paso, uh, I was having a nice little scene with this... Um, head of promotions for this uh, radio station. So she had taken me out for an amazing night and we'd had a night of love and passion and great time and um, and then she took me to the airport the following morning so I could get the plane and meet up and get the plane to mm -hmm. Phoenix. You know. Meanwhile, the tour manager and um, JC had got stocious and overslept and missed the plane. So I arrived, um, you know, I got this airport, managed to get my ticket, got on the plane, flew to Phoenix, uh, got met, thinking, hey, Mr. Tesco, um, you know, and there, so there I am, in, in, you know, my jeans were very torn at the time, very ragged kind of look I was wearing, and I'm stood there holding my belongings in a pillowcase. I hadn't really slept the night before. Feeling pretty good though. I was still quite, you know. Mm. And uh, I went to this very important television station and, and did this interview. And part of the interview was about what meant, you know, what defined cool. And so I gave my definition of what I thought defined cool and everything. And, and that ended up being the clip they showed. And there was this quite attractive newswoman, anchor woman. And so there I am one, you know, this was before I got become a fat lardy twat that I am now. So and I am de delivering this thing kind of mm, reasonably together, but not that together. And when it finished, she looked at the camera and said, hmm, nice, you know, because she was eating, which I was very, I was very grateful for. But, <laughs> but could, by that time, JC had arrived in Phoenix and he was spitting feathers because he missed Missed the opportunity to be on American television, but you know that was, and I think to this day he still gives Huey, our tour manager, a hard time for the fact that they overslept and all that. But um, no, it was it was kind of an interesting period. It was kind of very much by the end of it. In fact, I, I reference it a bit in the song I wrote later with um, Nico Ramsden and recorded with Mark Smith. Um, called um, Bro Goes On Forever. It was that whole idea that, you know, you'd go out on the road and they would keep you on the road, moving on to other gigs all the time to sort of see if they could get more momentum going because we were having quite um, a lot of momentum building up behind this track Working Girl, which was one of our last singles, it was on our last album. Um, and it was, we'd made a particularly good video for it and MTV was really happening at that time. And we were all over MTV like a bad rash. But at the same time, it was going through Arista, who were changing from independent distribution to moving into, I've forgotten who it was, it might have been Polygram at the time or something. But just as our record was going to hit, they did this and the independent distributors wouldn't release the stock until they'd been paid for money that they were owed and they had armed guards and so our record got caught in this and we did nothing. So we were turning up at these radio interviews uh, or TV interviews in some cases and people were going, so what's it like having a hit record in the States? And we're going, well, no. <laughs> We're not having a hit record, but you know, in Texas, you're number two or you're number one, or you know, in Louisiana or something, you know. Um, but nationally, because of this, this situation, we, it didn't happen. But the video was shown like every hour, 
for weeks on end. So wherever we went, you know, we could be in Buttfuck, Arkansas, you know, or someone like that. You'd walk into the deli or walk into a Wendy's or something and someone would go, that's the guy from MTV, you know, in the most mm. unusual places because people were just watching MTV all the time, mm. you know, of all ages. Um, but it was, so our management at the time, you know, was, was just putting more and more gigs in. So it was like the tour felt like it was never going to end. And uh, that's where, you know, that whole, the road goes on forever mm. idea. What about um, Berlin and Germany? Oh, Berlin. Well, I still, I've not been to Berlin, I must be honest, since the wall came down. Um, the last time I was there was the two nights before I got married and I was there with the Leningrad Cowboys and they flew my my then future wife, my wife and I out there to uh, to appear at a Leningrad Cowboys gig and um, and that was brilliant, well you know, at the time my dad said well you better take Francesca with you because if you missed the plane back, I'd rather you were both stuck in Berlin than you, you there and her here. And of course, we missed the plane back, you know. Which was a, the story of my life in Berlin, because they, the first time I went there, um, we got driven over there with, um, there was a club, legendary club called SO36. It's still sort of going now, but when it started, it was very much kind of like a, wild place in the middle of, I think it was Kreuzberg or Charlottenburg, but it was, you know, very like squatted town, anarchy town, you know, um, and they used to book British bands to go out and do, you know, maybe three nights and do a couple of gigs a night, you know, and you're like the house band for a little bit. And they would, they would come over in a band, pick you up, drive you out there and then drive back, drive you back. And, uh, we didn't have a record deal, but we were kind of band du jour in London That's by that stage. And um, they sent this guy Bobby over, pick us up, and good guy, and they were all brilliant people. And we went out, and uh, then the last night we were there, I went out drinking, and I ended up with this, this black GI and a load of hookers. I didn't know they were hookers at the time. I just thought they were all hanging around the black GI because he was such a good looking guy. <laughs> he was really tall and he'd been at the gig. So we went out drinking and that was one of those things that the night went on. And of course I missed the, I missed the bus back the next day. So I turned up at the hotel and there was this rather curt letter waiting for me saying, you know, someone who's supposedly so very cut price I was proving very expensive and um, reason being uh, they'd had to leave pretty much all the gig money <laughs> to get me back because of course they weren't cheap air tickets and I had to get a train to from Berlin to um, Calais and then the boat and then another train from Dover and, um, and I couldn't get the train till late in the evening so I turned up at the office of the promoters and they were just really pleased to see me and took me out for a day's carousing around various bars but all the whatever gig money we were going to make got spent getting me home and I got back just in time for a gig at the Windsor Castle and um, I had to sort of concoct a bullshit story that I'd been arrested by the police and all that when actually I hadn't and I'd just been involved in some kind of but I loved Berlin and every time we went back there we used to such a good time. I think partly it was this kind of island, you know, because we we drive there a lot. You know, over the years we drove there a lot, and you drive through Germany, which was just beige.